women could be fighting on the front line by 2016. An army review has recommended that close combat roles be opened up to female soldiers for the first time, but calls for further research into the physical impact it could have. Sky's political correspondent Sophie Ridge reports. For some, the idea of women in scenes like this is deeply uncomfortable. Fighting and dying on the front line. Chantal Taylor is proof that it's not just men who can fight for their lives. An army medic, she was the first known woman to kill a Taliban fighter in close combat. She can't show her face because she's still working as a security advisor in the Middle East. I'm far fitter and at almost 40 than I, than I ever was in the military because I train specifically for role now. So there are certain things, you know, weight training, strength training, endurance training that you can do. And so long as you have the, um, the mental and physical capability, there's absolutely no problem with um, fulfilling any role. Lorna, a journalist and army reservist, knows the reality of war. Her experiences in Libya and Somalia convinced her that women can cope on the front line. Women who've been on the front line over the last few years, even though they've not been members of infantry regiments, have had to have the same training, carry the same weight, go the same distance, have the same weapons, the same ammunition, and when they're in a firefight, have to react in exactly the same way as their infantry male counterparts. There are men and women who are small, tall, um, short, uh, physically fit, unfit, uh, strong, not particularly strong. And the selection criteria to get into the infantry will not change. The Ministry of Defence has promised an 18-month review to make sure that women can deal with the physical demands of the front line. It's something the chief of the defence staff says is vital. But if there's reservations in the military, it looks like the defence secretary has made up his mind. I don't think we should be discriminating against women because they're women. I think selection should always, uh, throughout our services, should be on the basis of ability rather than gender. And I think the armed forces have to reflect the, the country that they're serving. So I think they should be open to all on the basis of ability. A Ministry of Defence review found in 2010 that women in the front line could undermine team cohesion, but today's report says there's no evidence of that. So what's changed? Well, firstly, the political will is there. Ministers in this building say they want to see women in combat roles. But the world is changing too, and the military can no longer ignore what's happening abroad. Hundreds of British women have served in Iraq and Afghanistan, where three have lost their lives. In the fight against the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq, Kurdish forces have shown that female fighters can have the killer instinct. And key allies like the US, Germany, France and Australia have opened the door to women on the front line. It now seems inevitable that the UK will follow suit. Sophie Ridge, Sky News. Is this the right idea? Well, with me is Vix Anderton. She's a former RAF officer and now a research fellow at RUSI, the defence think tank. And joining us from Salisbury is Major General Patrick Cordenley, former commander of the Desert Rats. Thank you for both of you uh, for joining us on Sky News tonight. Uh, Vix, let's start with you, because uh, as a former RAF officer, what's your reaction to this? I'm delighted that the Ministry of Defence has decided to take such a positive approach to this. I mean, you have to remember that the restriction hasn't actually been lifted yet, and the armed forces have still got a long way to go to reinsure gender equality under the existing structures. Uh, Gen Major General, accordingly, what do you think of this? Because, of course, women are already allowed to serve in the front line in other roles, just not combat ones, so surely this is a natural step forward. I regret it's probably inevitable. It's not that I don't believe that women are quite capable of being aggressive and killing people, and that's a sad comment, and also that they can cope with all the physical demands. It's going back to this group cohesion. It's the dynamics of what you're actually asking them to do. Tank crews, sections of infantry are very small, and I, my own experience, six months in the desert living alongside a tank with my tank crew, and you suddenly impose a lady into that crew, is not good for group dynamics. It is going to cause problems over large periods of time. The experience that we had recently in Afghanistan and 2003 in Iraq is actually very different. It's not general war. What you can't do, in my opinion, is actually deploy with women in small groups of people without endangering group cohesion and the dynamics within that group. 
Max Anderson, what's your reaction to hearing that? I really have to disagree and actually the report finds that um, there's very little evidence that women in frontline roles will, uh, will undermine group cohesion. You look at the experience of a number of our allies now, women have been allowed in combat roles in Canada for example since 1989. Um, we're now one of only three NATO members who don't allow women in ground close combat roles so I think it's high time the UK military followed suit. Patrick, accordingly, uh, Vex Hunter makes a very good point there. Other countries are doing it, why aren't we following suit? There is not a good point. The point is that the other countries that she's just mentioned have not been involved in what I call general war situations. They've been very different situations where it is quite possible for arrangements to be way for different sexes to live in different parts of accommodation. General war, that doesn't happen. Human, what hasn't changed is human nature. And I can assure you that if you impose something which is going to cause a problem, or may cause a problem, it may not, but it may cause a problem in general, that is just what you do not want in very tight situations. On the other hand, Vic Sanderson, isn't there a case of thinking that perhaps allowing women access to frontline roles like this might actually lessen uh, fears of sexual sexism and sexual harassment? Yes, I really think it will. I think having more women across the armed forces uh, will improve um, uh, those issues you just mentioned around sexual harassment. Um, but the MOD has a, such a long way to go. I mean, 94% of roles in the Royal Air Force, for example, at the moment, open to women, and yet only 14% of that force is made up of women. So there are bigger barriers uh, to women's service than just this restriction. In other words, it, it won't make that much of a difference in, in practical terms? Unfortunately, I won't. Not without the, um, the kind of the uh, cultural and attitude change that's going to have to accompany this. And what about the physiological aspect of this? Because I note, Patrick, accordingly, that you haven't actually brought this up. You know, this is the thing that they're going to be researching more. Is a women actually physically equipped uh, to be in frontline combat? Is that not something that concerns you? Not at all. I mean, why shouldn't they be? Um, I, I simply think that is missing the point. And I go back to the point I'm making about small people in small groups and living close cheek by jowl, four people alongside a tank for six months. I just do not think that is a clever way to go around sorting out the best way of getting a group to fight together. And it may work perfectly well in some groups, but I can assure you it won't over a period of time in many of the groups. But surely, I mean, there are already frontline roles, aren't there, performed by women, other frontline roles, medics or signalers, things like that. So surely there must be circumstances where they have to be in close contact for prolonged periods of times and work in small teams as well with men. No, 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 yeah, but you're missing my point. And my point is that they have arrangements made for them when they go back to wherever they've, where their patrol has gone out from. In general war, that does not happen. So just imagine it. Put yourself in a similar situation and, and you know that actually when night comes or when you're going to get some sleep, you are going to be cheek by jowl with the section you're working with in the middle of that section. You cannot stop that happening in general war. And everything that you're talking about and time's moving on doesn't change human nature. Anderson, last word to you on this. Will that put you off as, as a woman in a top job? No, not at all. I think units um, and small sections will train for this throughout. Canada, for example, has already removed sex, sex segregated accommodation to remove this very issue. So I think um, our soldiers will continue to be the professionals that they are and they'll rise for this challenge. OK, Major General Patrick Hordingley and Vic Anderson, thank you so much for joining us on Sky thank News you. tonight. Thank you. You can get much more on all the stories we're covering tonight as we broadcast them on social media. Follow Sky News tonight to get extra content, including women sharing their stories of life in the military. And we've had lots of comments, as you can imagine, on this all day. You can join the debate online, like Mick Hayward, who says, it's bad enough to have to bury our sons. I'm not sure we're ready to bury our daughters.